Okay, hello everyone. As, as said, I'm Kevin O'Reilly. I'm a security researcher with Context Information Security. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the work that Context has been doing over the last couple of years uh, on security of cloud services. I'll tell you a little bit of the, the, the background. Um, Context was working a couple of years ago uh, independently, just did some research and found some quite interesting issues, some of which you may have already heard of. Um, so I'll talk about them in the beginning and then go on to discuss uh, some of the more recent issues that we found in the last year or so. So I thought it would be interesting to start, or useful to start with a, a definition uh, of what cloud computing is. So I've taken this from uh, Wikipedia. Um, I think the, the interesting word to me here is the, uh, in the second sentence that cloud computing entrusts uh, remote services uh, to, uh, sorry, you, uh, uh, software and computation, and more importantly, data, users' data, is entrusted to the remote service. Now, that leads on to the, the fundamental question underpinning all of this sort of work. Would you trust uh, a cloud provider with your data? And how do you decide upon whether you, how to make that decision? The, the normal way would be to do a threat assessment to try and understand what are the risks and what is the threat model uh, of such a, an infrastructure, what are the attack surfaces? So I think um, it's useful to contrast here against the traditional threat model, um, as that's what uh, the potential, the likely alternative is, is going to be. So in the traditional model, as we can see here, the attacker comes via the internet, usually to a web server, and then somehow through some sort of vulnerability, hopefully, in the web server or infrastructure, then can pivot from that onto a uh, database server or something like this behind. So this is an old uh, model. Um, it's well established and has been tried and tested for many, many years. So in the beginning, there were um, obvious weaknesses or, or um, flaws in the implementation of a lot of these things, but they were found a long time ago. So these days, if you decide to trust your data onto such a service, hopefully um, you know what you're dealing with, and hopefully most of the low-hanging fruit, if you like, in terms of security vulnerabilities have already been found. Um, that's not really true, I would say, of cloud security. It's a relatively new type of service. It's so it combines the old issues, but in a, in a new, repackaged into a new way. Uh, and of course, there are new issues too um, that are brought in by some of the complexity, uh, increased complexity in such a model. So I've taken this screenshot here from one of the, uh, one of the open source cloud platforms that you might be able to uh, find on the internet and which some uh, vendors use to, uh, to provide their service. And you can see from uh, the diagram that already we have quite a, a large degree of complexity in that there are four networks. Um, the external network via which you from the internet can access uh, the cloud infrastructure, the network upon which the API, uh, which you would use to control the cloud network, is Im implemented. Sometimes this can be the same as that of the external network. Then you have inside the cloud infrastructure the data network uh, upon which your nodes exist and can communicate with each other. And then behind the scenes, in theory, something that you should never really see as a, as a consumer or a client, if you like, is the management network, which is the network upon which the uh, back end of uh, the hypervisors exist. So if we now look at what the, the new threat model for cloud infrastructure is, we see we still have the traditional model. If you are an attacker, you can still try and attack the web server from uh, the internet, as, as was always the tradition. But now, in addition, you can become another um, neighbor, if you like, within the cloud infrastructure. As an attacker, probably for not a lot of money, you can hire a node or a virtual server on that infrastructure and use that as your launch point. Now that just vastly opens up the, uh, the attack surfaces. So there's the potential still, of course, to go via the external network, the internet, and to attack the web server. Quite possibly, um, though, uh, because the database server is being hosted on the, uh, in the cloud, the people that 
administrate that might well wish also to be able to access it directly via an external IP address, so that could actually open up another attack vector there. But of course, as I mentioned, there is this internal network also, so an attack from uh, the attacker's machine to the web server via the internal network is equally possible, or again, uh, probably just another few IP addresses along will be the database server in this model, and that's another vector. Then, of course, there is the, um, as I mentioned, the, the management network and, in fact, the infrastructure of the whole system, uh, which is implemented these days most often by a hypervisor and virtualization technology. Um, this might open up uh, a potential, as we'll see, and as, as I mentioned, some of you may already know about one of the original issues that Context found in the context of cloud security, which was uh, about hard disks, but I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. But that's one of the potential vectors, the memory, the, the processor, or the hypervisor. Um, these are all potential attack vectors. So the new, the new model of cloud, uh, of cloud infrastructure brings new problems with it. There is a lot of increased complexity. There are new technologies which may not have been involved before, such as virtualization. And as with anything new, it's easy to make basic mistakes. And as you'll see when I begin to talk about some of the issues that we found, uh, I would say that these types of basic mistakes have been made. So uh, the principal um, issue, as I've mentioned, is the separation of the nodes or the lack thereof within the cloud infrastructure. All the systems exist next to each other and uh, it, it, this makes a real problem securing your own infrastructure from your neighbor on the, on the cloud. Okay, so the first example, well, I'll present the, th we're go I'm gonna talk about three issues that Context has found. The first of which uh, was presented uh, a year ago and involves uh, the disks. And today I'm going to present two new issues that we found in the last year. Having, having published our uh, initial work last year, we were then invited by a number of cloud providers to do some testing on their infrastructure. And in doing so, we went on to find two more very interesting bugs, which I'm going to talk about today. So the first one, as I mentioned, is something that was found just over a year ago. Um, and this is a good example of how um, you know, something very, very simple can have quite serious implications when uh, you know, we're talking about something in the cloud. When you, uh, when you approach a vendor for a cloud-based um, server, uh, they will usually provision this using virtualization technology. And um, the API, in fact, uh, that I mentioned before that you have access to, you can actually do this yourself. You just, once you've got your contract and they provide you with an API key, you can then use that to access the API and you can provision your own node. Um, and that is, what happens behind the scenes is that uh, the virtualization software will create a new virtual machine and it will allocate a new virtual disk for that machine to access. Now, um, one of, the, one of our researchers, one of my colleagues, just over a year ago, when investigating this, just had a very simple idea of, of looking at what is on the disk um, that is on a freshly provisioned machine. So, of course, the first thing you're going to find is the operating system itself. So that's just been re-imaged probably from a, an image by the virtualization infrastructure. But the remainder of the disk is that for you to use. You would assume that it's been formatted, but Actually, in the, case, uh, in the case that my colleague looked at, the, the formatting hadn't really been done properly. It had been done in the sense that the operating system thought that the space was empty, but actually, if you were to just use a simple uh, DD command, to which to mount the, the partition, it was possible to read the actual bytes off the surface of the disk, and it was found that actually there, there was uh, lots of information. So the first time it was done, there was some, uh, some information that hinted that the, this was other, other clients' uh, data. It was repeated on many different, um, this, the experiment was repeated again and again, and every time a new bunch of data from a different uh, client of the, um, the cloud was found. So basically, everything that was left in that uh, unprovisioned space that hadn't been already overwritten by the operating system was left to, to find. So I thought it'd be quite interesting to show the response that came from one of the vendors when we approached them about this issue. 
So I don't know if you can all read uh, this here, but the, the real crux is that um, the initial response was that they do format the disk, but there is some garbage left, and it's up to you perhaps to, to DD it or to erase it as, as you will, without really taking heed of the actual implications of what they were saying, that in fact you were accessing other people's um, data. So anyway, that, that work um, you know, generated some headlines, rightfully so, and some of the vendors then approached Context to do some work with, um, with testing further their infrastructure. And in doing so, we went on to find a couple of new and interesting bugs, which uh, I'm about to describe to you. So the first of which is a bug we're calling evil, the Evil Pixie. So hopefully some of you will know what the PXE, uh, what PXE stands for. It's the pre-boot execution environment. It's something that um, a lot of BIOSes and computers have as a provision to be able to boot from the network um, and so in case of well, a variety of scenarios by which you might want to uh, boot from the network. So the process that happens is that the, the BIOS or the firmware will broadcast on the network looking for a server that is a Pixie server that has the ability to provide an operating system for it to boot. That's, uh, the server will reply, or a, a redirection service may reply to point the firmware to uh, the server that has the uh, boot image, and the boot image can then be downloaded through TFTP to the client, and uh, the boot process begins. Now, wh where does this uh, fit in in the, in the cloud? Well, it just so happens that the infrastructure that the cloud, that cloud vendors have used still uses you know, traditional virtualized BIOSes, and these BIOSes have the ability to do Pixie booting. Um, so just by doing a little bit of uh, speculative listening, once we'd, uh, got, once, we'd prov pro once we'd provided a node on the cloud, we listened just uh, to the raw network doing raw packet capture, and we're able to find that, in fact, there was a Pixie broadcast request going across the network. So it looked like something on the network was looking to boot from a Pixie server. So the obvious idea that followed from that was, well, if this thing is looking for a Pixie server, can we provide one? And if so, we can provide an image for it to boot from. And once we provide the image, we can obviously own the box. Um, it turned out that this box wasn't just any old box, it was actually one of the hypervisors that was broadcasting. It was doing so every hour or so, um, and the reason was because, well, we don't actually know what was wrong with the hypervisor. Within its operating system, something had gone wrong. This was triggering an hourly reboot, and one of the, you know, the real basic mistakes that had been made in terms of setting up the infrastructure was that the hypervisors all had, um, well, we, we can assume that this wasn't a uh, unique to one hypervisor that possibly all hypervisors were configured to um, broadcast uh, as part of their boot sequence for a, for a Pixie server, and if that failed, then to go on to boot from their local, their virtualized hard drive. So in this case, we did exactly the, the obvious thing, which was to create a Pixie server and create a, a, a boot image something like Nopix, which we customized so that it would likely have drivers for the network interfaces. Well, it's worth pointing out, actually, that as you see here, and I just, as I described before, the three networks that are available to the cloud infrastructure, it's worth noting that the Pixie broadcast was likely happening on both the, the service and the management network. Uh, so not only was the um, hypervisor configured badly to broadcast Pixie in the first place, but this was happening not only on the management network, which is where you would assume that a Pixie server would be desirable, but it was also on the internal network. So just by hiring a node and listening to the internet traffic or the network traffic, we were able to pick up this broadcast, and once we responded to it, we were able to supply a malicious boot image for that hypervisor, configured to automatically contact back to us, and once that uh, server booted up into this image, it did indeed contact back to us. We were then able to control it via SSH, and uh, thus we, were, we owned the hypervisor. 
and, and in doing so, we then had access to the entire hypervisor network, uh, the, the entire management network from which we could leverage you know, against other hypervisors and possibly even within that hypervisor there might have been other nodes that belong to other clients. So massive potential for um, data intrusion, if you like. This is, a, I think, an inter interesting case because it's not, it's not something that you could, uh, you would obviously expect to test for in an automated fashion, certainly. You wouldn't be able to scan for it. It, it required a little bit of, of nous on the, on the part of, of context to, to sit there and listen to the traffic and see what, what might come up. And yeah, so that this is something that I think is an interesting attack, uh, certainly because you couldn't automate it. Uh, the, f the next bug and the final bug that I'm going to describe today is um, a bug that was found in the VNC terminal, which, well, two bugs, in fact, were, were found in the VNC terminal. This is a service that allows uh, VNC access to the console of one of the nodes that you may ha have hired from the cloud provider. So it's just a classic uh, terminal emulator piece of software. The, the issue here is that it runs on the hypervisor. It provides access to the console of the, of the node that you've hired, but it, the process that provides this uh, emulation service and, and listens is running on the hypervisor. So any bugs, therefore, that are found within that process and can be exploited lead you to being able to own the hypervisor. And in fact, uh, not one but two bugs were found within the, the source code. So this was a bit of uh, you know, classic uh, source code analysis that was performed. And yeah, without wanting to describe the code in too much detail, it was found that uh, both of the issues really boiled down to signed integers and being uh, tested against unsigned and um, a potential for overflow into the into the negative um, range was possible, such that um, in, if I skip a few slides ahead, in the, in the context of a uh, VNC terminal, um, there are escape commands that allow you to uh, move the, the cursor. This is where the, the code that had the vulnerabilities, this is what it was performing. Um, and one of the, uh, the, the issue really was that when uh, providing an escape command with a number of, of characters to move, that number wasn't being tested properly for the possibility of overflowing into negative numbers. So it was possible to supply um, a very, very large number uh, such that it would become a, very, uh, become a negative number and there wasn't a bounds check on, on that number, which allowed um, an arbitrary memory access which obviously has the potential for uh, you know, remote code execution and uh, you know, owning the hypervisor from that point. And this, uh, this bug basically was found to be present in uh, two different uh, infrastructures that are both used in, in cloud provision. Uh, both Zen and KVM uh, were, were susceptible to this bug. Uh, but these bugs have now, now been patched. And that's why I'm able to talk to you about them today. So, um, having talked about some of the bugs that we found, we're, we're still looking, it's, it's something that um, is ongoing. We're um, still interested in looking for more bugs in the hypervisor and still think there's a uh, possibility for um, other bugs in the separation of the nodes as described. Uh, an example, or three examples of uh, some bugs that have been recently uh, found in, in the hypervisor. These weren't found by, by us, uh, incidentally, but they are uh, good examples of the possibilities that still exist for bugs in this, in this area. Um, two of these bugs allow for privilege escalation. Of course, essentially privilege escalation on, on the hypervisor means that you gain privileges you shouldn't have, and, and you know, these are very serious, uh, a serious class of bugs. So uh, one of the projects that I'm currently working on is, is to build, or I have uh, built the basis of a hypervisor fuzzer, um, which, is, uh, which works within the Zen um, hypervisor. And is basically the sim simple idea is that it takes um, the hyper calls, which are the calls made from a guest operating system or a, a, you know, a, a trust, uh, one of the operating systems that may be provisioned to you where you are a client of a, of a cloud provider. And then uh, it just 
give spurious information or spurious parameters to the these hybrid calls to find out if they've you know if there are any potential issues to be found there and the the three bugs that are, I listed before are examples of things we hope to find with that type of research okay so that pretty much wraps up all that I want to talk about As, if there's any questions I can take them now is that, is that John Grinley with, with the microphone um, Paul John yeah John are you I can't see her. I think we're a, bit, we're, we're a little bit under, but that was um, that was very interesting from my point of view. I think um, cloud is something that a lot of people are, are worried about. Um, yes, please. Yeah. Um, so if anyone's got any questions, please raise your hand while we get located. But just bear with us while we find the microphone. Although it's people at the back, you can shout, please. Yes. Okay. So the pixie boots. Is there a legitimate reason for pixie boots to be in the hosted environment? Um, that's a good question. The question was, is there a legitimate reason for our Pixie Boot to be in a hosted environment? Well, firstly, I would say there is there's certainly no uh, legitimate reason for it to be broadcasting on the, uh, the, the, the local network, not the management network. Uh, possibly there might be uh, an instance where um, a Pixie Boot might be desirable on the management network from the point of view of uh, the provider. They may wish to, um, if, if a hypervisor goes down in a, in a terminal way. And the, you know, the, the hypervisor that we found that had this problem in this example, um, we don't know what that problem was, but it caused it to reboot every hour. It may be that um, that's a scenario you can envisage maybe that the provider would want to provide a, a Pixie server for it to boot from, but certainly in this case, they didn't provide a, a Pixie server. Otherwise, if, if, if they had done, we would likely have seen it not you know, keep recurring into this scenario. So it seems that I'm being, well, I'm open to the possibility that there could be a reason, but we, we can't necessarily think of one. But certainly, um, the, uh, if, if a Pixie boot is desirable, it should be broadcast only on the management network and not on the, the network uh, to all the other uh, other nodes. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Oh. That's not good. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, um, with the evil pixie, um, to get that working, you obviously had to set up a DHCP server. Um, so the two kind of thoughts I had was, would you not get detected because of the rogue DHCP server? And secondly, could you perhaps use that rogue DHCP server in another attack, like a DNS-based attack or something like that? Yeah, I, th I think um, that's an interesting question. I think in the, the context of the work we were doing, we had been given permission uh, by the cloud provider. So this, this was a cloud provider that had invited us to come and, and test their infrastructure, having seen the work that we'd done with the, the dirty disks bug in the beginning. So we had, a, I guess, a carte blanche to, to do whatever we liked and to run up such a server. Um, in that specific case, I think we would have been... I mean, I think obviously you're going to run into difficulties um, doing that sort of stuff if you if you don't have permission to do so. But I still think it would have been possible for an attacker to because this uh, this these pixie signals were very um, um, predictable, so they happened on the hour every hour, um, or it may have been a two-hour period, but it was a very it was a f fixed period. So um, I think it would have been possible to time the. The you know the bringing up of the the DHCP server in order to catch that and catch that only without hopefully making a huge amount of noise and and making you know your presence felt to the, the cloud provider in the case of an attacker. But I do think yeah uh, to answer the second aspect of the question that there are potential um, issues with doing things like this. I mean these are the sorts of uh, attacks that uh, people should be aware might be possible in this sort of infrastructure to run your own DHCP server to give, um, you know, to start dishing out IP addresses to uh, other people's nodes on their reboot is definitely something that is possible uh, and something that they should be uh, looking, that the cloud provider should be hoping to prevent whether or not they actually have anything in place to detect this sort of thing. Um, I, I really don't know, but they certainly should do, as we've proven. I think there's a question at the back there, Adriana. Hey, Kev. 
Do you think in your experience this is just uh, not, n not taken away from the evil pixie, but is it cloud infrastructure rehashing old techniques that we were doing in the 90s? I mean, the pixie attack was very similar to the stuff we were doing when we were breaking into data centers and abusing the Solaris jumpstart functionality, which is exactly the same kind of thing. Is it a case that vendors are just not really learning? I mean, because these attacks aren't that new. Yeah, I completely agree with that, that point. Um, these attacks are, are quite simple and they don't seem to be new. Um, it is somewhat alarming that um, the providers hadn't predicted these sorts of things, but you know, in, in a way I guess it's human nature uh, and we're just going through another phase of the evolution of the way that these things uh, evolve. Um, so that's why um, the underlying point probably is that cloud infrastructure is an immature uh, technology and we, we've shown by our examples that these that very simple mistakes are still being made. It wouldn't have taken uh, you know each of these examples you can easily uh, understand how they could have prevented them from happening and if they had learned from the lessons perhaps back in the day as you describe maybe they could have prevented them but the bottom line uh, or the, the kind of takeaway point from this is that these mistakes are being made and so if you're considering trusting your data to the cloud, these are things you need to take into account. Or if you're considering looking for bugs, this is potentially an, a ripe area for research. Anybody else? Well, I think there's, there's a few actually hands up now. There's a, one at the back and two at the front, I think. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm just interested mainly uh, on the first point about the dirty disk. Uh, obviously, it's something that we've seen um, sort of in, in other areas. But I was just wondering, in, in this case, where you're looking at it in the cloud, and you mentioned in particular uh, VPS.net, and that you've been working with some of these providers, I wanted to find out, because you didn't mention, are, is this something that they've actually fixed, or uh, do they know about it and they haven't yet done anything? Uh, they, yeah, this is something that they do know about and have fixed. I think. Um, to be honest, why this existed in the first place may just been have been an oversight in terms of uh, the provisioning of a new, um, using a virtualization software, perhaps locally you might not need to do uh, this extra step, but um, so it might have been a box that they failed to tick or perhaps they uh, thought that they didn't think this would be something that would that would be attacked and maybe thought they'd save uh, on hard disk failure by minimizing the amount of writes to the, the surface of the disk. But either way, um, you know, th this was obviously a major problem for them. But they have, uh, this was something that uh, was reported just over a year ago. And as far as we know, all the providers that we've contacted about it have changed their processes to ensure that when a new uh, disk is provisioned, or virtual disk, that the entire surface is zeroed. Uh, so that this sort of thing isn't possible anymore. I don't know, I think there was a couple of questions down at the front. Um. Thank you, Kevin. That was very interesting. You said you were invited by the providers to do this. Uh, was it in response to something that they'd seen, perhaps had complaints from their, their clients? No, it, it was actually just in response to the, the dirty disks issue. Um, so that was just independent research that Context had done off, off our own back in the beginning. Uh, we thought that uh, cloud security or was a, a, a new area for us to research. So we did that, that initial work uh, off our own back. And, um, Upon the publishing of it, that's when the vendors approached us to uh, do a, a, you know, a more thorough, and a, because I think going back to a point another chap made, th th these sort of tests obviously uh, you can get into some hot water if you're not given permission to do them. But so we were invited by them and given sort of free reign to to do whatever we wanted on their within their infrastructure, and that's how we went on to find the, the second two class two bugs. Well, that's really useful work. And I can see there's some sort of uh, demand for this type of work to be ongoing, perhaps on a more regular basis. Uh, have um, any cloud providers uh, come up with the suggestion that they would like a more routine check of their systems like the one you've already done? Um, that is a good question. I don't know of any such uh, arrangement, but I, I certainly think um, well, 
of course, I would say that I think they should do something on a more, more regular basis, but I still think there are, there's, there's huge potential for um, more uh, bugs in this area. Just looking at some of these, the, the hypervisor bugs that I listed there were only found within the last six months, um, and some of them are pretty serious. So it looks to me as if it's just, as I said, part of the process of evolution of these things that at the moment uh, there's still lots of bugs to be found, and I think... Um, Providers should, especially when they're changing technologies and and changing their systems, should should have them thoroughly tested on a regular basis. So the issues you shared with us, you said they've already found fixes. That's why, indeed, you shared them with us. Yeah. You don't, I don't want you to tell me, uh, but are there any other issues that you're aware of right now that you're dealing with that uh, the fixes aren't in place for? <laughs> uh, not at the moment, but uh, it's something we are actively working on. So, thank you. Do we have any more questions? Yeah, I'd just like to ask oh. one. Um, you mentioned that hypervisors are new. A lot of people that um, have been using the, what you described the traditional model have been using hypervisors for automatic provisioning for some time now. Can you share, us an, share anything with us about the posture, without the name of the companies, obviously, but the posture of the companies? For example, are they... Are they companies that we would consider to be security conscious? Are they existing telecom and web providers? Or are they new entrants to the market that may not have us, you know, already um, gone through penetration tests and security reviews and et cetera, et cetera? Because some of those techniques would be applicable. For example, the pixie bug wouldn't happen on an uh, organization that had implemented, say, private VLANs for example, yet they would on most telecoms companies on their NMS networks if they hadn't. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, high, I'd, I hope I didn't say that hypervisors are that new, because of, of course they have been around for a, a while. I, I'm tempted to think that the reason that there are still so many issues in them is because uh, in some of the scenarios they were previously deployed in, uh, perhaps it wasn't considered so uh, pertinent for them to be um, tested to the extent that they are now being used in cloud deployments. But um, in networks, as you described, that, that do use uh, these technologies, there's definite scope for um, you know, these bugs to be leveraged. It's not, they're not, all of them aren't exclusive to, uh, to uh, cloud environments. The, um, the VNC terminal uh, bug, or the VNC terminal service, is something that's used quite a lot in uh, Deployments of Zen, uh, you know, or Zen Server, the open source version of Citrix Zen, or and KVM, which are two large hypervisors that are used elsewhere. So, yeah, I was thinking particularly about initializing disks properly and securing uh, NMS and admin lanes. It's something that a traditional provider would fall foul of if they hadn't taken appropriate security measures, irrespective of whether it was cloud. Or yeah, just a absolutely. hosting. Yeah, that that is very true. Um, I mean, I, I guess I don't I don't really know the, the answer in 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 the sense that I, there is no particular difference in the sense that you could hire. Were there uh, any entrance to the market? Is basically what I'm saying. Were they no, so, yeah, sorry to answer that aspect of it. The, some, well, I think there was a mix a mixed bag really. I think uh, some of the vendors certainly are not new entrants to uh, the market and were. You know, well-known uh, vendors that um, moved on to cloud from and cloud hosting. absolutely, yeah, oh, absolutely, okay. and uh, so yeah, it, it begs the question as to why these these mistakes were made, and you know, is alarming that they well, exactly. were. Exactly. Why, why would someone that was doing it right before stop doing it right? The or only that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if they were if they were ever doing it right. I hope they were. I think the the answer as to, I mean, perhaps in the case of the disk, you would assume that they they should have been doing zeroing them properly in the traditional sense, and maybe it was just an oversight. I think the increased complexity of these new environments, and uh, even at the time that we were working with some of these vendors, there was a lot of change going on in the way that they were implementing them, and it was a very fluid process. Well, well, you've got onto their admin land. Yeah. I mean, the, the, there is, that means it's just not secure. <laughs> yeah, end of, you know. You mullet them. 
Well, in, uh, yeah, we did in this case. I, I, th I think uh, I think some of the uh, I think perhaps in the case of uh, um, you know some of the services that we are looking at, that they were more exposed because of the fact that they were in the cloud, and you know perhaps these issues have existed for some time in more traditional environments, but weren't so exposed. Uh, that's I hope is what the, the reality is, but who knows? <laughs> Do we have any more questions? Oh, I think we we have uh, sort of one there and one in the centre. Excuse me. In your um, diagrams of a of a virtual machine you spun up, you showed that it had an interface on a public network, a management network, and a potential other data network. Every VPS I've ever spun up, you get one interface. So how are you able to sniff the traffic or access the, the other networks? Um, well, it's a good question about um, being able to access the different networks. We weren't um, able to do so. Uh, it, we weren't able to access the management network. I think the, the key in the, the evil Pixie was that the Pixie was configured to broadcast you know, in the firmware of the machine to all interfaces. So that was where the problem lay that we were able to that was on the i mean i should clarify that you know there is the internal network you do have access to so that if you're uh, the, the the subnet that you're um uh, so you're when you gain uh when you have a virtualized node you have an external ip address via which you can access it um and you but once you get onto that box you have access to the internal network which uh, on which you may find other uh, clients' um, infrastructure, but they are aware that, that this, they should be aware that this, this uh, network is not private to them, um, and so th there's no, hopefully there's no issue there, but the, the issue with the Pixie book was that the hypervisor was broadcasting on two different networks. Um, it was broadcasting on the management network and on the, on the internal network, uh, just probably through a uh, misconfiguration or a complete lack of configuration and so we were able to pick up that tr that broadcast on the internal network and respond to it give it the uh, image to boot from and one um, once it had booted it had uh, you know we used a nopix type um, uh, image that has lots and lots of drivers in the hope that we would pick up uh, all the interfaces on the box and that's indeed what we did and that was how we then gained access to the management network Hi, it's uh, just a question about the Pixie boot again. Um, it, was it, broad it was broadcasting on both the data network and the management network. Yeah. Where would it have normally been getting its image from, off the management network? Well, um, or do you not know? That we that's... don't know. I mean, I, I am not convinced that there was, there was ever. My, my gut instinct is that this was just uh, an oversight that the that the Pixie w was just in the BIOS of, of of the hypervisor and hadn't been configured. Um, otherwise, well, certainly two mistakes were made. The one that that it was. Uh, broadcasting on the management network and the internal network, but secondly, you might say it was a mistake that it was looking for a, a Pixie boot at all because it didn't appear that it was um, booting from a Pixie server. Um, so um, my gut feeling is that it was just a, two oversights in the fact that it was it had it had a configuration to Pixie boot in the first place. I thought so it was a mistake. That was my second question: is could you have done it the other way around and said, we'll pull the Pixie image from wherever it was getting it from and own that box instead? Become the, become the hypervisor by loading its image up. That's, you know, that's another interesting angle. You know, if there is a, a, a Pixie server out there, and perhaps you, you, you could certainly capture the, um, the boot image. Um, but you would assume that if they had a Pixie server intentionally that they would have restricted it to the management network only. So we wouldn't have had access to that, that server or to be able to get that image, I think. Okay, I think there's time for one more question, if there is any. We've actually got two, there's one. Um, assuming that the, the, there were a Pixie boot server on the management network, um, would you not then have the, the, the problem of timing for the, the DHCP responses? Because obviously the quickest one uh, to reply would be the one that it would take its, uh, its configuration from, and the, the, the one that you stand up may not respond quick enough. 
Absolutely. Uh, and that's, I think it's on that basis that we uh, decided that there wasn't a Pixie server, just because uh, th this thing was broadcasting you know, r repeatedly and it seemed, uh, and it was doing so on a kind of hourly basis, that there wasn't. I mean, we wouldn't have been able to pick up the reply from a Pixie server on the management network, but just by virtue of the fact that it broadcasts uh, so many times and so frequently, we gleaned that there wasn't any such Pixie server. Okay, well, I think we can do one last question, then we need to, okay. we'll need to crack on. Thank you, Kevin. You've had a lot of questions, but thank oh, you for answering them very well. Okay. Hi, so moving away from the Pixie questions, um, <laughs> have, you, uh, have you done any research in terms of targeting placements of machines? So if you go to a cloud provider, you provision a machine. If you want to attack a particular customer of that cloud, it's advantageous to try and get your host node in the same network area as, the, as your target. So for the dirty disk type attack, you were presumably just getting random data, but yeah. you wanted to try and recover yeah. data from a specific Well, I, I think the answer to that is uh, yes. Uh, that in as, as much as I know about it, my, one of my colleagues has been working on um, a, an attempt to correlate um, external IP addresses with internal IP addresses. I don't know the details of it, but I think the, the, the crux or the gist of it is to have uh, to hire um, a virtual machine within a cloud provider uh, and to use uh, some sort of uh, fingerprinting to, to try and correlate between a known external IP address that they that say of someone that you're targeting specifically with an internal, uh, you know, the internal IP address of, of that interface. So I don't know the details of how that in uh, the correlation is done or how it's inferred that these that's the case, but that is the idea behind it. So it's certainly an idea that we, we're considering and looking into. Hey, Kevin, thank you very much. That was very interesting from my point of view. I think that the thing of sort of common mistakes, uh, allowing people with, with a brain, as you said, to figure this stuff out is, is quite impressive. And um, I think we have sort of big data, big impact with some of this now. But um, thanks very much, Kevin. That's great. Okay.